Shalom Chavrim, I'm Stephen Ben Danun with the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. Today I wrote a little short article on our website, Is a Returns, uh, kind of a title like uh, Biblical Prophecy May Allude to the Pope. And rather, I know it's a rather strange uh, title to kind of give that, and of course I forget exactly the way I wrote the title, but, but something along that line there. Uh, but the reason I wrote that is because more and more I keep finding scriptures that allude to Pope Francis. You know, normally you can find yourself in the Bible by your life, by the way you act, by the things that you do. If you tend to doubt God's word, you can see yourself as Thomas, who was the doubter among the 12 apostles. Uh, if you see, seem to be the type of person uh, that would... Uh, you, you claim you will fight for Yeshua, you would do anything for him, but when the battle comes on, you kind of cower away. Well, you see yourself as Peter. Uh, if you see yourself with the boldness, you're never afraid to speak on God's behalf. You'll stand right out there. Well, then you're like Peter after he receives the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Uh, but on and on, we can find all kinds of uh, types and similarities in our own individual lives. And as I was, did the message just the other day about the sanctions that the Vatican has, has uh, influenced the leaders around the world to, to bring about sanctions against Israel, it was clearly because I see, uh, knowing that the European Union is controlled by the Vatican anyway, as well as the United States, and all of them calling upon boycotting Israel and their goods until they go back to the pre-1967 borders in Israel. So... It's quite evident who pulls the strings in the European Union as well as the United States and other nations around the world. We know the Vatican has a stronghold in all of these places. And of course, the Pharaoh of Rome, or Pharaoh of Egypt is and one and the same as the Pope of Rome because as I mentioned to you, the biblical uh, historical side of that is about Hadad and how Hadad, uh, who was one of Esau's descendants, goes into Egypt, he's raised by Pharaoh, learns all the gods and the traditions of Egypt, and of course we see that goes, uh, he goes into Syria, becomes the king of Syria, then goes on into Rome, and then the birth of the Catholic Church is born in Egypt, excuse me, born in Rome, but it's got all the the, uh, the gods of Egypt is brought right along with it. So the sun god, the moon god, etc., and all the traditions that follow the Egyptian ways we see clearly in, the, in Rome and the Vatican. But so therefore, as I saw the story in Moses with Jethro there, when we're looking back in the, the Egypt, uh, uh, when, when God had called Moses to go down to deliver the children of Israel, the first thing that, that Pharaoh does was sanction the, the Hebrew people of that day because he felt like they weren't doing what he wanted them to do. And that's much the same that's happening to Israel today. They're not giving in to the demands of the Pharaoh of Rome, which is the Pope. So therefore, he is sanctioning them in order to be able to get a two-state solution so that the Vatican can have their own grounds to build the third temple. Uh, not what the Jewish people would like to have, but what they would like to have, that is the Vatican. But now I run across another scripture, even after that, that really struck my heart once again. And again, just opening to the scriptures, finding these and seeing the types, the similarities. In this particular scripture, over in the Gospel of John, chapter 12, it says, Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was uh, which, excuse me, La where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper. Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a, a pound of ointment of spikenard, very uh, costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Issachariot, that is, Simon's son, um, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? Then he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare what was therein. Then said Jesus, let her alone against the day of my bearing hath she kept this. For the poor always you have with you, but me, you have not always. And it just really struck me 
when I saw the part about the poor, because John clearly says he didn't care about the poor. He just held the money bag, and he was a thief. Now, I can't say specifically that Pope Francis is a thief in this regard, but no doubt historical documentation has proven that the Catholic Church has swindled money out of millions and millions of people down through the ages. During the Dark Ages, the indulgences that the Church used, preying on the people in order to get them to give up life savings, lands, and everything else, gold, silver, you name it, in order to be able to build up their empire, telling the people that if they gave, they would have their loved ones prayed out of purgatory, etc., and etc. So the church as a whole, and the pontiffs in the past, all the way up to present, have been, in effect, thieves. And of course, they have held the bag, they have held the purse all along, claiming yet to be the true apostles of Yeshua, that is, Jesus of Nazareth, claiming to be one of his apostles, and that Peter was the first. Well, indeed, I would have to agree. They are a type of one of the apostles, but it seems more fitting that they are a type of Judas Iscariot. Because, yes, they do hold the money bag. They hold the purse of the world. And, of course, they do not really care for the poor. In fact, in an article in Huffington Post, which you can see on the, in the article that I did there, um, there was an article that was written uh, called Pope Francis... Uh, humility does nothing for the poor. The article was dated on uh, March the 29th in 2013 by Nigel Bar uh, Barber, who wrote the article there. And he even spoke in there about how that, although the Pope may be, as he put it, may be sincere of heart, but you won't see him liquidating the Vatican assets in order to give to the poor. So therefore, he even questions his humility. Well, we can see that not just in the Vatican, but in other churches as well, as well around the world. They're so busy building up the mega millions and building up their great cathedrals and churches. And how much do they really care about the poor? Well, the Vatican, you can count on for sure, will not sell all of its golden assets, nor its stocks and bonds and all the different treasury houses around the world to even one iota to change the poverty level. But yet, as Judas did, they will sit there and preach you a good sermon that it, you should sell what you have in order to give to the poor. Well, I would say one thing. Our ministry does not have riches, neither do we have a big building. The only assets we really have are those that we use to film and to speak to you. But we do try to make it a good practice. Carry a little extra so that you can give to someone that you see on a daily basis that is in need. We should practice what we preach. Unlike how it seems that the spirit of Judas, which is, by the way, the spirit of Antichrist, because he was like Christ in every way, because the apostles never recognized that he was the one among them that would betray the Lord. Also, we can see in this story of the rich young ruler, very much the same. He comes to Yeshua and wants to know how he can have eternal life. And of course, Yeshua, he asks him, he says, you know the commandments, and he names several of the commandments off, and the young man says, these have I kept since my youth. But of course, Yeshua knew that he was lacking one thing, and that was he had much. He said, take what you have and sell it and give it unto the poor. And you shall have treasures in heaven. And the young man went away sorrowful for he had much. Could Yeshua actually been seeing the infancy of the Vatican in its infancy in a story that would speak of their future? Because, of course, we know Paul later says that, that spirit of Antichrist was already there among them. So perhaps these words of Yeshua, that is of Jesus of Nazareth, perhaps these words were prophetic, speaking of the Vatican and how, of course, they may not go away sorrowful. They certainly will not sell what they have and give to the poor. And of course, like the rich young ruler who did keep all the Ten Commandments, 
I don't think we can find that in the Vatican either. At least some of the commandments we know for a fact they have not kept over the centuries. I'm Stephen Bendenen with the Newman Institute of Biblical Research, a production of IsraelReturns.com. God bless you. We thank you for watching, and good night.